Ladies, we all need to take a stretch and a break, but thank you for your patience for that tech break. Um, uh, like I said, my name is Jackie Nguyen, and I'm really pleased to be here. This is really exciting for me to, to come and listen to all of you and, and everything we have going on here in New Zealand. I wasn't expecting to talk. I was just hoping to come and listen, and I'm just really honored to be able to speak to you and share what we've been doing with Class of Food Coalition and a little bit about you. So. During the last class, you know, I had this aha moment when uh, I was sitting in a tank bar, I had just been in cleanups. I got to the point where I was starting to say, you know, so I had to go out to the But I also saw, too, that my friends that were doing beach cleanups um, were uh, not connecting the dots. They could go off to be out there and be good for a drink, and they were all sitting on straws. And I was like, you're not just see what we just uh, picked up. And I saw the reactions, it was really stunning to them. And they were just realizing, and I, and I knew that we had just kind of become desensitized to the problem. Literally in front of our nose, and nobody was thinking about it. One of the lines I used was, you know, that next job, maybe after the last minute of your drink, or not at all, if you didn't ask for it, you came. Uh, but yeah, it's going to tap out with new generations to come in our environment. It was definitely what I was doing. So I saw the reaction to my friends. Like we, I kind of became the, the annoying uh, friend when we go out, uh, no straws at the table, I would go around, and I had friends that, you know, white straws and sensitivity, um, or whatever reason why, let's say, I didn't want to shame anyone, um, but I also wanted to empower them, so I had a pencil case with all kinds of different straws, for people who wanted them, needed them, I have, um, so I just kind of started on my own, I really didn't, uh, you know, in this, true slack of this manner, I was just kind of, you know, start to talk and talk to people. Um, but I really got to a point where I got to serve that class of straw and I was overwhelmed. I was doing these cleanups, but I wanted to stop at the source I didn't know how. In California at the time we had a drought and we had a water crisis campaign at the time. So they mandated, it was a state mandate to only serve water upon request in restaurants. And that was it. That was my light bulb moment. I got served that plastic straw in my water, which I wasn't even like aware of. So I was really conscious of it, but I didn't think it would come over part of it. And I was in Santa Cruz, we have a Monterey Bay Green Sanctuary. And I took it out over the Monterey Bay Green Sanctuary, and I was just so dejected. But when I saw that placard say water was precious, straw upon request, I said, that's it. At least the restaurant producer, straw upon request, with nothing off their back. I knew, I work in the restaurant industry. Um, uh, so my out of job that sparked and because my brother owns a restaurant. I knew that, that, that if they said that they didn't give a straw, they just throw the straws upon request on their menu. They did not give it to people automatically. They had huge percentages who did not ask for straws. Because most of us do not have them. Um, I also knew, I looked down and I was like, who really needs a straw? And I knew that the, the disabled community would be one affected by this. Um, I would make sure I knew the kids would take the time. I saw kids get empowered by that because a lot of times, especially in the United States, you take those out and they're, they get little sippy cups and little straws, like they can't hold a drink. Um, and I knew that they'd be empowered to say no straw or say that they're going to die. So I really wanted to be positive on messaging. So it was a play on the last straw, but I made sure to say the last plastic straw. I'm not going to get straws, um, I'm not going to straw bands um, for uh, minimizing and eliminating seaweed straws. I knew that this would be, was really actually never about the straw, it was about seaweed plastics and the certain age of the plastic community. So that was my, my premise. I knew that the only way the industry could come after me and the measure of my success is when um, hopefully the, the disabled community would start speaking up and they start hearing it. Because if you started getting, that was the only negative uh, that you could see. 
that initially uh, piled. And so um, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I, I knew we'd give movement and it had something to do with me. I knew when I started a, a Facebook page and started going out, I, you know, I'm not the sharpest tool to say, I was just thinking and thinking about it. And it's actually a surprising amount of kids that, that last lot with that we started to say it was possible to be used. So once I kind of started reaching out online, it was just pouring in. And I was sharing it was those open source, I was sharing information, and it just kind of do something. Uh, all of my That was kind of the premise. The hard, the hard feedback that uh, Warren talked about. You know, I've been making gradual success locally. I started to go a little bit global with online participation and. Um, but when this, this happened, I called this the swap around the world. And, um, you know, at the time, that just blew up my inbox. Everybody sent me this video. I reached out to the uh, Christine Sinegar, the uh, scientist who took this video, uh, because everyone was sharing it with me. And I said, I asked her permissions, can I share it? Can I, can I show this photo in my presentation? She said, yes, that I, I want to get this out there. And, um, so I do show this to kids. We actually contacted her. I, um, 200 straw campaigns showed up uh, that year alone. Uh, and, and a lot of them were informed by the last class of straw because all of these organizations who I've been reaching out for years to say, I think plastic straws are gonna be the tipping point issue. And they were like, oh yeah, low, low hanging fruit. I'm like, no, can't get an issue. This is the kind of thing that they all came to. Hey, if you want to work with you, you want to work with you. So there's a lot of reduplication of efforts, which I didn't expect, but now that I was 90, um, I know that a lot of it's funding and stuff, so people were grasping at friends and doing it. But I also maybe check myself because it wasn't about me or credit or anything. It was about the movement and the movement was happening. Um, but it was really at, at, at the beginning of the, the this we grew up, it was at my expense. I was holding down three time three jobs self-funded and i was just it was happening i was just saying yes to everything so oh my god here it is but it was really stressful and um i have to say the the one uh organization that reached out and actually collaborated in classic policing bulletin which i was already a member of in 2014 i was so excited to be part of that conversation and to reach out with other organizations to really plant this seed about the straw and so we created this uh Get the straws in the sea turtle and went over to uh, Trader Pledge. And so, um, and I became a project of Plastic Fishing Coalition. And I was able to get uh, some partial funding at the beginning, and then I became a full time project. And this really blew up at the height of the in 2016 into 2018. That was kind of the height of all the plastic straw bands. And it was insane. I mean, I was on, on it's a news channel, so it's been happening. Uh, of course, the industry was, was attacking the straw, trying to. It, but they couldn't keep up with all of the bands or the uh, upon request, which was a really easy way. And I have to say, it, it also proved as a gateway issue for a lot of policy that was languishing and staggering. Um, we had politicians that never even had an environmental record that would stick their neck out and say, hey, this is pending, and this isn't quite a ban if you can just have them you know, upon request. Um, let's do that. So it was happening on the local level. Uh, but they had no idea what they were stepping into because the community uh, was informed and they were like, the minute you start talking about single use plastic straws, you have to start talking about all the other things. So it really kind of opened up a lot of these comprehensive bans, even if it started with the straw. Um, I have to even say like in California, we were the first one to have a statewide a straws upon request law. And I was actually upset with that. Nobody consulted me. It was a young Senate, uh, young uh, congressperson in our um, state legislator who proposed this. And he didn't have an environmental record either, but he was young and ambitious and he wanted to stick the neck on it again you know, with that. What was really interesting, and he didn't talk to me about it. So I'm like, no, 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 it has to be comprehensive. Like, that's what the whole point is. Um, but he did it and, it, and it passed fairly quickly. But what happened was exactly a year. So the date later, it became a comprehensive upon request law. 
So that's one thing to think about too. Like you got to meet people where they are and do it that way, and it really proves these people put those group thoughts together. So it's a really exciting time. This is this is uh, really about prosecution publication. 2009, we really are a communications organization. We have a vast uh, um, coalition, and it really started off because there was a lot of data coming out at the time with, um, uh, in the ocean with gyres and everything else, and we were, they were quantifying the amount of plastic out there, right? The industry got involved and, like, oh, we care. And they, one of the first um, marine debris conferences, they were at the table, they actually put a lot of money similar to like, you know, Top 27 with Coca Cola. A lot of money out, we were like, you know, sponsoring all these, these uh, plenaries and, and talking. But what they did is they bought themselves a, a seat at the table. And so, when it came to the end of this, this conference, uh, they would not sign off on calling it what it is classic pollution. They would say, No, it's green degree. The green degree could be a coconut or a palm branch, right? So, that's kind of what the impetus was with this. We started off with a small group and saying, You know what, we want to, we're committed to calling it what it is. And I'm happy to say, that it's been very successful. Um, in the last few marine debris conferences, presentation after presentation, calling it what it is, plastic pollution, we're seeing it in the news, it's, it's working. And so that's, that's part of what we really want to do is it's, it's, it's messaging to get it out to the public with um, working with our scientists, working with our celebrities, working with all the organizations. And it's unique that we have at this point uh, almost half of our coalition in businesses. And, and NGOs. It started off very NGO focused. They also that puts a lot on us too, because we really have to bet. There's a lot of greenwashing going on. And we actually even have to look at our own coalition because at the beginning we were just all encompassing. Take a pledge. I'm gonna I'm gonna pledge to you know be plastic free or, or, or work towards it. Come on in. And now we're like, Ooh, no, we need to we need to pull this list. We need to be really particular with businesses and really uh, watch what's what's happening out there. So we just hired our first um, full-time coalition manager, poor guy. Um, he's an amazing guy. We're so happy to have him. Uh, his name is Adrian. And um, if you guys are interested, I would uh, connect you with him and I encourage anyone to join the coalition. You can join as a community group. You can join as an individual, school group, NGO, scientists, scientific advisors. You can see it. I would love to have you more and um, some of the stuff. It would be great to have you guys. That all kind of inform the best you make those out. So do you have a brief? Kind of what we're about. This is the, the, um, the depth of our coalition. Um, mine would be higher than that now, but I'm going to And this is what we do we provide a platform. And we really are kind of doubling down on the on our strength in communications now that we've kind of built into this point. Um, 2018, when I was involved in the, the height of the plastic straw ban, we got to a point where the the, uh, the word of the year was dictionary was single use, which is great because I, when I got on to plastic pollution coalition, and we're going to talk about this, I'm really strict on words. It's not because it's, it's kind of because I'm a little bit dab. It takes me a while to understand concepts. I'm not very good at books. I'm I've never been uh, diagnosed with all my friends. That way, since I'm Sam dyslexic, because I'm a very uh, visual learner. And I do take things literally. I had a teacher in first grade, her name was Mrs. Sleeper. I used to always look at her like, it's just you know, it's just like things just, so if it doesn't make sense to me right off the bat, like I don't get it. And I have to delve in and I really have to work harder to understand these concepts. But I also think it helps me to communicate as well. But that's kind of my 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 uh, weakness and strength. So disposable. When I first started with plastic pollution coalition, they said refuse disposable plastic, and I said, why are you saying disposable? We're we're reiterating, uh, you know, perpetuating industry falsely this. And so now we've changed it. You know, I said if you're going to say disposable, put it in quotes. You know, but now we're saying single use, and I was really excited about that. Also in 2018, the uh, the food story of the year for the first time ever wasn't even about food, it was about seeing these plastic uh, straw bins. So I was really excited about it. I had actually got asked on um, Fox News, I got yelled out on Fox News. And um, so it really kind of hit a window at that point. And then since that point, it's just been, especially a lot of businesses, a lot of people. Have been. This is our reach. It's actually probably higher than this now. Um, this was taken in 2019. 
just to give you an idea of how you know we really uh, amplify the message and get out. And so we're really excited about this. And we really want to. Um, we created. Um, the, we have our, actually our biggest team ever, and it's mostly communications. Um, we also we have a great communications director right now, Jen Bell. She came from Greenpeace. Um, she was the engagement manager, but she has a journalism background in editorial. We also have we're proud to have Erica Serino, who's um, uh, a journalist and, and she's a science interpreter. Right? She's, just, she's just got it all. So it's been a lot of it's been a joy to work with this team, and to, they make me look good, you know, because I am not. I, I really wish I had command of the English language to be able to say it in ten words or less. Um, and if you think about Picasso, you know, he was actually a really good realist and he could do a few lines and you can understand what it is he said. And to me, that, that's my goal is to be able to say it with less words and people understand. So here I am. What am I doing? All right. So part of that is speaking to the classic, I call it. And I made a point just like I made a, a point back in 2013 when I finally stopped being a slacktivist, more of an activist. I started my Facebook. Uh, page. I made a point to myself that every time I get in front of a group, I was going to talk about plastic straws. Every time I get in front of a group, I'm going to talk about speaking to the plastic. So this has been my initiative right now. I'm the advocacy and engagement manager for Plastic Solution Coalition, and this is really what I'm doing. So what does that mean? I'm, I'm getting around, I'm getting out, I'm uh, engaging with schools, with groups, with uh, uh, media, and uh, and, and speaking on behalf of the policy, speaking to uh, legislators as well. What am I really doing? You guys can relate. This is what, so it's all exciting, and then everything came to a halt, and uh, and then I was stuck on, on Zoom. Um, but what we did is we shifted, and I think, you know, the silver lining with COVID is actually made us all kind of slow down and stop, and I think a lot of things that we're doing, even these conferences, I mean, I think it's always going to be a hybrid now. I love that we now have access and it really made us get more accessibility to stuff. A lot of these conferences, when I was just a little um, you know, individual starting off on this, I wanted to be part of that, that conversation, but I wasn't invited into that early. Until the straws, like to God, I even was, I really wanted to get involved in policy because I thought that this would be a great way to start policy. And I wasn't invited into those rooms until um, policy on a state level in California was coming up. One of the hardest sells to move was not the public uh, and not, you know, talking to people they got it. It was my colleagues working in this space. People get really myopic and they get, you know, get caught into the thing. And I found myself having to uh, explain it to my colleagues, the importance of, of plastic straws and that it was trending and to kind of take this into go. And so, um, that was part of my struggle when I started off. And, uh, and even in the cost of the bar, I remember I finally got invited and we had to talk about it to this group. And it was on the agenda. I was super excited and got to my point. And, oh, we're going to talk about straws. And immediately produced it. It was like, I guess we got to talk about straws. And I was like, come on, man. I got to of you guys, everyone on a silver platter right now. You know, it's like they might be talking about plastic straws, but they're talking about plastics. So I called I call it the gateway issue, but now I call it the key to the door and everyone's in the room. And actually the real work is happening now. So it's like, how do we take people to understanding is that yes, it's a problem and they're seeing it everywhere, but what we can do. And this is where the real work happens. And it is it is up to it is collaborative and it is work together when we see multi-state work. So words matter. Um this is just some of my, my stuff and what I'm saying right now, how we can get snappy. Uh, they like to have these terms and, and I'm challenging my colleagues to flip that script on plastic and, and some of the things. So these are some of the terms that I like to use when, when we have these conversations. Um, you know, we, we need to grab them and, and industry knows how to do that. Um, we're, we're, doing a, we're doing a bad job. We're, we're, we're killing people with data. We have to explain it all. Even when I get into messaging meetings, You'll have one one pithy term that, that the industry uses, and then we have a whole explanation of what that camera term is. So what I try to do is try to it's less it's plastic waste. Sometimes I just say wasteful plastic. I try not to use the word plastic and recyclable in the same sentence because I don't want to perpetuate that myth. Um, but when I do, I'll just say you know 
plastic was ever made to be recycled. You know, so if I say that, uh, you know, if I say downcycling, then I'll explain that plastic was ever made to be recycled. And that makes people think, you know, and then they would start the conversation. I think why that is, you know, and then I can kill them with all the data and whatever, but whatever they, okay, leaving where they are, but be able to come back with something that they understand that they can, they can relate to, that they go up oh, and they can think. And industry's really good at that. If you've ever go to talks, and I found this a lot with a lot of bag bands because industry is really big on that. We go to talk and show the bag and movie, and then there's always some guy in the audience, older gentleman, and he start off with, hi, my name, he'll be, he wait to the end for that question. My name is blah, blah, blah. I'm a PhD in NASA, blah, blah, blah. He'll do this whole thing, and then he'll like plant the seeds out of that plastic stuff. Isn't, isn't uh, you know, paper more of a carbon, all that stuff, right? And so you have all this little many, everybody all, you, know, you just showed this movie, and then you've got this guy, look it out. So we need to be better at just kind of nipping this stuff in the bud, telling it like it is. We need to be more provocative because I know all, all my friends in, 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 the, in the movement are like, we can't talk about toxic. We can't talk about it. Yeah, we can. There's enough cause for concern. And you could say, you can be provocative in your in your language to make people stop and think and then be able to, 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 to show them to the studies and show them what, like, what is happening with the class. So greenwashing, right? So one of the things you want to talk about is that you know this whole recycling thing. I don't know if you guys are aware, but there was a, a talk in 1956. This guy, Roy Sauter, he was a marketer. He told the plastics industry, the future of plastics is in the trash can. If you can convince people to throw this away, you got a whole new market. Well, guess what? That is what's been happening, you know, in my lifetime or whatever. So And this is part of the classic. I put, I put recycle, I added those quotes in there um, because that's another thing I want to talk about too. These recycling rates that we keep talking about plastic, is it really recycled? It's, 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 I think it's more of a reclamation rate of what we're reclaiming. But what are we actually recycling? We're downcycling. What are they calling recycling? It's incineration, whatever. So what is part of that thing? So this is where I want us to really kind of think about how we're communicating this. So, is this a solution? Well, I we created these cards. We got one urban pack kit, and people always joke around. My, my boss sees me travel. I have everything in my bag, and I'm a Coral River guy. I pack it in, pack it out. So I have usually I have my titanium. I got, I'm regretting I had I didn't bring my titanium plates because I had my I had to stuff my computer in my uh, bag instead. But um, because I would have liked to have that for the, the tea. But anyways, I bring it all. And we had two cards. We had one made um, for tabling when we were tabling a lot that had stuff like, you know, what you can buy in the market, like your nice little, you know, eco lunch box and your blah, blah, blah. And then I created one that's actually stuff that you can bring from home, like with this, uh, you know, uh, fork from home. Like maybe my next thing will be like stick a fork in it. Like what would it take to stick a fork <laughs> in your bag? And you don't, you don't need this, this cost intensive, right? Um, and there's some things that I would do differently, like instead of that, that little kooshy, this thing that you can get a white, white house uh, mason jar, and that's one pint. You can do hot and cold there, you can do soups, you can do your, your coffee. And then what I did, besides, you know, we had like this big pretty koozie, but I also taken like full socks. If you've got nice full socks, you can get holes in, but they got cool stripes. You cut that, and that, that becomes my little koozie. And it's quite, you know, especially in Santa Cruz, we've got a lot of tipsters that love to do that kind of thing. But Anyways, that's a so you can create your own DIY, and we actually ran out of those cards faster than the ones that showed all the all the, the stuff you can get in the market. Plastic. Uh, I love Gorilla Marketing. This is actually a cool uh, group. I forget the name of them, but they're out of the UK, and they're like a marketing firm. And I would love to get more marketing firms involved and do some work pro bono. But these guys are doing some great, great creative marketing, um, and they're showing up and putting this stuff. Love it. This is one of my uh, favorite quotes. Um, Everything we make is back to the earth, and people food or poison. Makes you think, right? Um, and it's true. There is no waste in nature. We are working against nature. And so some of the things that we think about, some of these changes also happens with design and, and how we design products. And I think that the, 
the answers. I love, I just want to say, I, I love the APA and what, what we had done for that, that document that we were getting ready for the INC and the Maori um, um, definition of plastic, new skin. I'm not even going to attempt to say the Maori word. I'm really bad at, at the, I'm just on my third day in, in yeah. uh, New Zealand. But you see, I think that's a really great concept. And um, and I hope someone's, we have someone here to speak more about that, but I thought that was really uh, great that we did. And, and also going back and forth about life cycle. Uh, is it really, it's not a living thing. So why are we giving it life, you know, lifespan? But even lifespan is life. Like I like to say um, the existence of plastic, you know, to try to get away from that wherever I can. But sometimes if I have to say something like that, I'll say lifespan as well. So, okay. Great Control Plastic Pollution Acts. Um, we were involved in that. There's a lot of great stuff happening, and that's actually the least the U.S. can do. It's 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 a comprehensive bill. People say it's like month 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 but it's actually um, deals with plastic uh, in our environment in, in in the U.S. and the least that we can do to even be part of the Plastic Global Treaty. And it's actually pragmatic and practical. It's things that that pass on the local and state level. Um, and it has um, environmental justice components. It's got a lot of, we have the indigenous voices there and each year we keep bringing it back and we're, we're, we might call it something different next year, but it just gets better and better but the more that we bring the toxicity and stuff. Yeah. Um, some of the things that we're working on in uh, Plastic Pollution Coalition, we started this upset scorecard, next, next one. Uh, we collaborated uh, with um, Google Food Lab and came up with this tool. And um, so we're solutions focused. Um, one of my favorite uh, leaders in the movement is uh, Sherry Mitchell. She's an indigenous uh, lawyer. Highly recommend you checking her out. She's got a book called Sacred Instructions. And she talks about the 10 10 80 rule. That 10% of our time should be, fine, should be spent researching the problem, right? Learning about it. Another 10% stopping harm. So they talk about the peaceful warrior in indigenous um, teachings. And that's like, you know, we have uh, our, our indigenous people stopping the pipelines and wherever we can, we stop it. But the full 80% of our time should be spent on envisioning the future and working towards the future you want to see and be. And that's what we like. I really challenge ourselves and we really challenge ourselves with Plastic Pollution Coalition to focus. We do a great job of showing all the problems. We need to do better on solutions. And industry is talking about their solutions and they've already shifted. They've got the solutions for us. We need to be better at that. And anything that we see that's a true, real solution, highlight and promote that. Um, filthy Lot Bottles, another uh, thing that we started. It's a, it's a great uh, initiative that we started in um, uh, the U.S. And next one, we're going to do the video. And this is a quick, quick video about Filthy Lot Bottles. Great. Administration is the market billions of dollars in this problem, and the plastics industry is just foaming at the at their mouth right now. They want to replace our lead pipes with plastic pipes. So, part of this is not bottle. We're, we're taking off Coke to not bottle. We also have other Polish members taking off replacing uh, pipes with, with copper instead of plastic. So, global plastics tree, we're going to hear about that later. But one thing I want to point out here. Is this uh, tap? This is Ben Von Wong did this this tap, and I want to say they've been bringing this up to Dinea for many years, and this year they finally agreed on the global plastic treaty. I really believe the power of of art, you know, and, and how it's changing. And, and 
everyone that was in the negotiations had to walk by this every day. People were taking pictures in front of the vehicle and lit it up. And that was investment. It was turn off the tap. The power was, was in there, the, 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 the image was the message. So, you know, we might not have changed the world, but our change is people and people change the world. And I think that that, that proves it right there. So it's really important. So it's, it's all about communication and how you can do it. And art is very common. So it's also design, right? How do we design the future you want to see? This is from a movie called The Her. And I was really astonished the first time I saw it. What was different about it? I didn't see a lot of Cindy's plastic. And, and people were like, oh, visitors. They wore, um, they wore like uh, uh, natural clothing. Like they had that. The, the, the high waisted um, wool uh, things, they were all, everything they had, like this little uh, phone, it looked like an old school, it had brass and leather, and it had like wooden things. So it's like, well, what would the future look like if everything was taken care of and really kind of sterile? You'd be expressing yourself and, and having like more handcrafted kind of things, but also with your technology. But unfortunately, you know, there's one thing that classic probably had to show that, that I think that was, was class with the classic top. And then I was so excited because I thought, like, oh, is there no plastic straws in there? And I went back to look at it. And, and this, this cup, this um, this little uh, paper cup actually won design awards that they, they featured in there. And, and you actually don't need a straw in it, but what did they do? They threw a straw in it for this one scene. And that was like the one, I was like, oh, of course, the straw. Okay, mm -hmm. that's one. So flip the script on plastic. So it's not even design, but even you know, like what Warren was saying, it's it's also system uh, system design and how we how we do that. So I think it's really important to think about the whole the systemic approach to the, the design and how we're doing it. I tell kids, single use plastic is a design fly and we design the future. It doesn't have to be this way. It's not just material, but it's also the whole systems behind how we're dealing with waste and what we're doing. Uh, flip the script on plastic. I'll just have some video. Excited about this. And this came about because we did a, uh, a study with the Annenberg uh, School of uh, Film in um, uh, USC and the uh, uh, Norman Leader Foundation. So we actually commissioned a study and they took like the 20 top shows uh, that was happening on streaming and radio TV in, in, in the US, the, the North America, we have Univision and some um, Spanish channels as well. What they found is that there was on every episode there was an average of 26 uh, items of single-use plastic shown on screen, and some of them were mass plastic events like a tiger or whatever with this, the uh, solar cups. But um, a lot of it didn't show like what happened to that plastic um, and, and, and how they disposed of it or how they did it. Was it part of the story? Did it need to be there? So it's kind of like tobacco and stuff. We not only want to take plastic over the production, but really heavy on single use. So how do you clean up the back of house of production, but also how do you um, create storylines and characters and normalize, like like you saw the Angelo with the I mean, this make it so that it's not this extreme, but it is it's normalizing see um you know usables and, and having that as part of the character development and stuff. We actually if you go on our website, we had a, one of the silver lines too, COVID that we really had to shift and we got some really incredible webinars. We had a great webinar uh, talking to some of these um, uh, writers who are writing it in scripts and also some of these directors and producers that have really taken it um, to another level and been able to successfully have close to zero waste text. 
it's going within. So I highly recommend you getting on and checking out our webinars. We've got a lot of a lot of different subjects. And that's one thing that we do we want to skip to you. We've got a lot more impact that we would have never had thought about doing until early happened with that kind of Sorry, I don't know where's what uh yeah, that's it.